It's Sunday, the 18th of March, and we got a quick update on the FIU bridge failure in Miami. Thanks to links provided by you, the viewers of this channel, we're going to take a quick look at some dash cam footage of the actual bridge failure showing the exact point of failure, the entire set of conceptual drawings from the Florida International University of the entire bridge design, and we're going to finally try and clear up what sort of bridge design was this in the first place. Is it a cable stayed design? Is it a web truss design bridge? And it certainly is not a suspension bridge. We'll take a closer look at the drawings and see if we can clear all this up. First, let's take a look at this slowed down dash cam video of the actual bridge failure provided by A. Pico here recently on YouTube. Here's the truss member in question. Here's a crane that's holding the harness and the worker that's tensioning this tension rod in this web member. Even with the video slowed down, the bridge collapses very quickly. It appears that the harness holding the worker fails and the worker falls. The fact that an employee was sent to tighten a tension rod on the left side of the bridge from this view at this point in the construction process is going to be a very important interest to NTSB investigators. The way in which this bridge was transported is going to be of special interest to investigators as the original design plan showed support for the bridge while it's being transported to be supported very close to the ends of the bridge with a support beam in between the shoring. But as things so often change in the real world of engineering, the supports for the bridge were brought quite a bit inboard to make room for obstacles in the roadway, forcing a, a large section of the bridge to be cantilevered beyond the supports of the mover. This was taken into account, calculations were done, and increased tension was added to the two outboard web members to account for this cantilevered condition. On an interview with the movers, they explained that once they got the bridge in place, one of the things they needed to do was release or relieve the extra tension that was added to these two outboard web members once the bridge was in place. Here we can get a better view from under the bridge showing just how much of the bridge was cantilevered over or hung over from the supports of the moving equipment. From the FIU preliminary design drawings, again these are not engineering drawings, these are just conceptual drawings, Here's the main span that was in place. Here's the second span that was not in place. Trust member 22 is the one we're looking at and talking about. And here's the detail of the connection for the tensioning rods for each end of the bridge. Detail A, you'll have to flip this image around in your mind to look at it for 22. Here are the two tensioning rods for truss member 22 and truss member 2. Here's the two tensioning rods for truss member 3 and truss member 20. At the time of the incident, this truss rod was the rod that was being tightened by the construction worker on top of the bridge. This truss rod is a dead end at the top of the bridge and is tightened or stressed from the other end, from the base of the bridge down here. So this is the rod that investigators are going to be looking at very closely. These drawings also clear up the fact that each web member has tension rods, two tension rods, through it, which only makes sense as each web member is made out of concrete and concrete is only strong in compression and not strong at all in tension.
Remember too that forces change throughout each of these web members as loads roll across this bridge. Here's truss member 22 which appears to have blown straight through the top of the canopy when it failed. This is an area that investigators are going to be looking at very closely. And here is what appears to be the tension rod blown partially out of the web member with the hydraulic tensioner still attached to the rod. Investigators will quickly be able to determine the status of this rod as they take it apart and see if this rod failed in tension. Questions are going to be when did it fail in tension or when did it begin to fail in tension? Was this rod compromised during the move? Was this rod compromised during the load testing? Or was this rod simply compromised at the time of the final tensioning when the bridge failed? Remember when steel rods fail in tension, they reach their maximum tensile strength, then they become elastic, they deform permanently, and with the addition of just a little bit of more tension, the rod quickly and suddenly fails. Investigators will also look to see if this rod simply pulled through the concrete structure from the other end. So what kind of a bridge design is this overall? It's kind of a hybrid mixed design. If this were a true cable stayed bridge, the main supporting members would be these cables. This is not the case for this bridge. The primary supporting members for this bridge is the truss design of the two individual spans. This allows them to use the ABC or the accelerated bridge construction technique to drop these two spans quickly into place. So I stand by my argument with, along with the NTSB that this pylon and these tubes, they're not even cables, they're pipes, are primarily aesthetic. They do, however, add a little additional stiffness to the bridge once it's completed to minimize rocking or moving of the bridge as loads move across it. But these are not primary structural members. And I'll give you the link to this uh, PDF file here and you can read all the details in here. Here it says, contemporary iconic cable structure provides an aesthetic gateway attracting people to enjoy the unique experience. The tapering pylon reaches a height of 109 feet. Here it says, the cable state pipes, these are pipes, not cables, increase bridge stiffness for pedestrian loads. Powder coated white for long term durability and maximize opportunities for a variety of nighttime light colors on the stays. Here's another reference to the stays and pylons on the design of this bridge. The tapering pylon reaches a height of approximately 109 feet with 81 feet above the bridge creating spectacular views for the users of the bridge and those driving beneath. The pylon heights and scale with the built environment, multi-story buildings and parking structures on each side of the bridge. The stays and pylon provide the required structural design to meet the pedestrian loads for harmonic conditions and natural frequencies and create dramatic signature aesthetics that tie directly to the rhythm of the strut pattern. So in other words, these add just a little bit of additional stiffness to keep the bridge from bouncing as loads move across the bridge. Again, the primary structural design of this bridge is the web truss feature of each span. Finally, here's the detail of the tube stays. They are merely 16 inch round diameter steel pipe cut off and bolted to each end of the structure. There is no tensioning cable running through here. There is no adjustability of these stays. Certainly unable of carrying much of a load. Instead merely adding a bit of stiffness to the overall bridge design. Primarily these stays are for aesthetic reasons. So lots of information for investigators to look at including the use of new and environmentally friendly materials. As the top of the brochure from FIU states, 
We are reinventing the web truss. Anytime you venture into new engineering territory, you are inviting and creating additional and new modes of failure. I'll continue to follow this story as new information develops. And in the end, we still have six fatalities over the simple design requirement to create a pedestrian bridge that can safely span 178 feet.